And I'll be sending a follow-up email either this afternoon or tomorrow, um, focusing specifically on this training. Um, but of course, if you have any questions, Antoinette is going to be prompting you to ask those questions. And um, you know, I'm here in the background if you need any assistance in any sort of way. So with that, I'm going to pass it along to Antoinette. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am excited to be presenting this session on phishing and ransomware. Um, a few housekeeping rules. I know that in a lot of cases you can't turn your camera on, but if you can, I'd really appreciate it. It's hard for me to present to a bunch of black squares uh, in order to make sure that you guys are understanding what I'm talking about, just to get the visual feedback, I'd really appreciate it. Of course, if you can't turn your camera on, that's okay too. Uh, but I am looking for active participation. There'll be some sections where I ask questions. If you want to just write that in the chat. Uh, in the past, I've used applications to try to make it interactive. And there were so many technical issues that um, we just I just decided that I'm going to leave it for the chat. So I do have the chat open up if anybody has questions or, or want to you know answer the questions there. That's great. Um, if you don't understand something I'm talking about, especially in this session, it is a, it's, it's borderline technical. It's not super technical, but it is borderline. Please stop me and ask questions. This is for you. And um, I want you to get the most out of your time with me. And unless uh, you have a question or need to chime in, please stay muted just so that um, we don't have any disruption in the audio. So I will start with the introduction. If you've taken my training before and you've seen this, I apologize in advance. Um, but for the new people that don't know me, my name is Antoinette King. I uh, started in the security industry just over 22 years ago. I was a technician, so that picture up at the top here, that's me on the Statue of Liberty installing some wireless equipment back in my 20s. Um, I've been in every gamut of security position you can think of in physical security, and then uh, also got my Microsoft certification back in the 90s and a plus certification, which is a hardware certification. Fast forward, I got my uh, went back to school in my 40s, which I always say is not as easy as it was in my 20s, got my master's in cyber policy and risk analysis from Utica College. At that point, I recognized that my passion for security was just reignited because um, it is, uh, you know, it's no longer nation state against nation state, it's nation state against individual citizens and some of our most vulnerable uh, populations are schools and libraries and, and houses of worship. So doing this training is very important for me to kind of make me feel like I'm at least doing my part in helping us shore up some national security. Um, I've been married for 22 years. I have two incredible boys, actually three if you include my fur baby. Uh, my oldest son, Tyler, is at Fordham and he is in the Air Force ROTC, uh, majoring in information technology and, and minoring in cybersecurity. And my youngest son, polar opposite from my older son, he actually is in 11th grade in Pine Bush, goes to Orange Old Sturboses for welding and uh, swears he will never work a day in an office in his life. And then of course that little furry guy down there, that's my golden doodle, Avery. So I would love to hear from you all. Um, if you can just give me one or two words for your role in the um, library that you're working at, that would be fantastic. It just helps me to understand um, my audience and who I'm speaking to. If you just wanna throw that in the chat for me, that would be fantastic. And usually the chat is located down at the bottom. Okay, so we've got trustee, head of adult services, director. All right, awesome. Great. All right, so I'm gonna start with the agenda real quick. Um, thank you all for putting that information in. It's it's really important. I see a lot of trustees here as well. So I am a trustee, by the way, for the Mamacating uh, Library. So uh, I hope that you all will take this information and, um, and pass it along to the rest of the trustees. Um, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about background and statistics, then we'll talk about phishing. Uh, then we'll talk about the various stages of a ransomware attack, and then finally get into a little bit about um, incident response planning. So don't worry, I'm going to be very thorough in my explanation of things. 
But I think it's important for everybody to understand these things in order to really get the full picture of what ransomware means. And I think there was, um, Bernard is uh, uh, IT network analyst. So please, if you have anything you'd like to add or share, I do not know everything about everything. So I would love your feedback as well. So thank you for participating. Uh, sure, Any, anything I can, thanks. Fantastic. We're, we're stronger together, right? So if you've done my trainings in the past, you know I like to do these fun videos, but before I do that, I just need to make sure that I share the audio, which I should have done beforehand. There we go. This is CSEN News. Hi, I'm Jody Anderson. It's full disclosure time. CSEN has been the target of a recent ransomware attack. The hackers notified CSEN executives of the breach and said, if we didn't pay the ransom, they would seize control of our broadcasting network and show nonstop night court reruns. Fortunately for us all, we have a redundant, totally independent broadcast network and we're able to avert this troubling disaster without interruption. For more on how to respond to a ransomware attack, we go to Laura Mitchum. Ransomware attackers don't always contact the executives of an organization. Often they will send the notice to the rank and file, like you and me. Here's what you should do in this event. First, do not engage or respond to the hackers. Second, take it to your management and let them move it up the chain of command. And finally, don't talk to the press. The decision of taking this public is in the hands of your executive team. Hopefully this never happens to you, but now, if it does, you're ready. This is Laura Mitchum. All right, so that was a little kind of satirical video um, to talk about ransomware. It happens to everyone, uh, just so you know. And I think recently one of the libraries in the RCLS system um, did have an attack. I don't know which one it is. I don't even think it's important of who it was. But uh, ransomware is very, very common and prevalent, especially in uh, more vulnerable targets. It's the easiest thing to do. Uh, and it also is something that, you know, used to be that you needed to be a sophisticated uh, attacker. And nowadays you can actually go online and do ransomware as a service. So someone who has very little technical capability can um, buy modules, if you will, of ransomware and then initiate phishing attacks in order to launch that uh, the ransomware. So what is ransomware? Ransomware is a type of malicious software or something we consider malware that lo uh, take, locks access to a computer system or files by encrypting its data until the ransom is paid. Um, so there are a couple of things that we need to really recognize here. Um, first of all, it, there are multiple different ways that ransomware can be launched against uh, an organization. Phishing and email compromise is one way. Uh, there are other ways through vulnerabilities. In, for the purpose of our training, we're going to focus primarily on phishing. Those are the things that I think that um, this group actually can have some control over versus um, some of the other ways, which would be like vulnerabilities within software and things like that. Uh, so I don't think that it's really worth taking your time to, to deal with that. RCLS really focuses on those things. So a brief history on ransomware, just so that we all know, ransomware is not something that is new. Um, the first uh, recorded instance of ransomware took place back in 1989, and it was specific to, um, at the time, obviously, you know, there was the AIDS epidemic that was going on, and it specifically related to, um, to AIDS and the World, uh, World Health Organization. Um, it was transmitted, believe it or not, on five and a quarter inch floppies. I don't know if y'all remember that. And the ransom that was demanded in that time was $189. If you fast forward through time, right, um, we've got all of these various different um, uh, ransomware attacks and the amount of money that's been uh, transferred based on these newer attacks is up in the millions of dollars, right? So it has gone from a small group of people that had access to being able to uh, disrupt business, if you will, to a large enterprise. It is a business, right? So um, organizations, it's, it's mostly organized crime and nation state actors, but use this, uh, the funds that they receive for various different uh, negative things, uh, including Iran uses it for nuclear proliferation, 
proliferation, sorry. Um, so where these organizations or I'm sorry, these countries that have sanctions against them will use ransomware to fund those types of projects. So when you're thinking about, you know, making the decision as to whether or not to pay ransom, just consider what that money is being used for in the long run. This is a super busy slide. You really don't have to read every single word on it, but just know that ransomware breaches just from 20 to 21 went up by 13%. Um, the average ransomware payment was 541,000, but I don't even think that paints the, the right picture uh, because when you look at the, the kind of the range, uh, we had a ransomware uh, Ryuk uh, attack, and I think you know it was twelve million dollars in 2022 that was given for ransom. So that's just the payment. The actual cost of a ransomware attack could be exorbitant, especially uh, if there's a, a lot of recovery that has to be done. So um, the the other really most important thing on this entire slide is that 82 percent of cyber breaches involve human element, um, such as. Uh, clicking on things and downloading um, PDFs that are malicious. This is CSEN News. Oh, I apologize. Hi, I'm Jody Anderson. For everyone's benefit, we have modernized the following 18th century quote. Nothing is certain except death, taxes, and topical phishing scams. Yep, that's right. Whether it's a natural disaster, a global pandemic, or just a high-profile piece of legislation, you can bet the scammers will be right on the heels of it. Some studies indicate that one out of three untrained users fall for phishing scams, and two out of three data breaches include some form of phishing. Yet another study shows that four out of five dentists recommend sugarless gum for their patients who chew gum. But that's another story for another time. Here to help you be on the lookout for phishing scams is ACE reporter Laura Mitchum. When it comes to topical phishing attacks, the tricks are often the same, just modified to reflect a recent event. Here are a few things to look out for. Always be wary of any new recipient addresses added to an email thread, and inspect any duplicate addresses carefully. Scammers will often use similar domains to trick you. Always be on the lookout for misspellings, swap letters, numbers or symbols substituting for letters, or unusual domain suffixes. When in doubt, check it out, but not on email. Sometimes a trusted partner's mail account could be accessed by a bad actor. So pick up the phone and double check with your customer or associate at a known number. And finally, if the request is urgent or involves something substantial like changing or submitting new payment information, give it a second look. Urgency is a common ploy used by scammers and changing the billing info is how they make their money. That's all for now. Till next time, I'm Laura Mitchum. So as you saw, um, there's a specific type of phishing that is called topical phishing, right? And we saw that a lot during COVID. Unfortunately, we had um, organizations that used the, the um, pandemic as a means to, uh, you know, get people to click on things. It was a lot of times it was, you know, here's the latest statistics, or this is the new policy, click on this and download it. And next thing you know, um, the, the organization was infected with malware. Uh, but email phishing is not the only type of phishing um, that is out there. And I wanted to kind of go over the types of, of phishing so that you are aware. Um, so email phishing is kind of just the generic sending out mass email list uh, to people hoping that they download or click on something. Spear phishing is a little bit more focused. So they um, specifically use a target. So in an email phishing scam, they send it out to all as many organizations that they can get to. Spear phishing is a little bit more customized for a specific individual or organization um, and with, with much like more purpose driven. In whaling, it's usually going after a specific individual. So they wanna go after a CEO or a CFO to get them to click on something. Um, maybe in a whaling uh, situation, they wanna try to get that person's, that individual's credentials in order to get into um, more like administrative type access to various different things uh, within an organization. And then we have, Smishing and vishing. So smishing and vishing have to do with the phone. Smishing is SMS text messaging. I've been getting a like major wave of smishing lately. I don't know if it's because the elections are coming, 
but an awful lot of text messages that claim to have access, you know, or want me to click on something. Uh, a lot of them look like they're coming from the IRS. Call, you know, click on this or call us. Or vishing is an actual phone call where you're getting um, a voicemail or somebody, if you answer the call, telling you that um, you need to stay on the line or press one to speak to so-and-so, or they'll call and say, there's a problem with your computer. Um, so please, we're gonna email you a link, click on the link so we can gain access to fix your or update your computer. So um, that's a little bit more creative way of getting to people. And this newest one um, is called farming. And it's uh, a type of social engineering cyber attack where criminals redirect internet users are trying to reach a particular website to a different fake website. So it's a spoofed site. And it usually um, is aimed to capture things like people's personally identifiable information or login credentials, social security number, account numbers, whatever it is that they're actually looking for. Um, so, and then sometimes when you go to that site and you click on something, it'll actually launch and install malware on your computer. Uh, so they often target websites that are in the financial sector, including banks, online payment platforms, e-commerce sites. And the main um, objective behind farming is usually identity theft or the theft of personal information. So um, website cloning is actually really, really easy to do. Um, and, you know, maybe I can do something with a, a guest, uh, like a spot guest or something. I have a colleague of mine who's um, with the um, formerly NSA and currently works for the Naval Cyber Warfare. And he is an offensive cyber person and does some really incredible uh, demonstrations of how easy it is to take. And he does it live, you know, to take like an RCLS website and clone it and make it look like a real website and then send it out to people. Um, there's really not much that you can do as an organization to prevent that from happening other than educating people. Uh, but it's usually what they'll do is they'll take a particular website. For example, if I'm a .org, they'll do that website.com or .edu, as long as you don't own the URL and URL is open and they'll redirect you to that site and then have you, it, it appears identical. And it's done with free tools actually. So being mindful of um, confirming websites when you're on them is, is really, really important. Anybody have any questions about the types of phishing? Nope, okay, good. It's pretty common, everybody's heard of it at this point, um, but just being alert and aware, we all work, a, like on, you know, at a hundred miles per hour. And so sometimes it's just remembering to double check things when you're looking at an email. Um, if it looks like it's coming from somebody and it's that, you know, but it's asking you to do something that's out of character, like the video set, pick up the phone before you click. So I wanted to go over the stages of a ransomware attack because I think it's important for people to recognize that um, the ransom part is pretty much the end. So people think that the incident occurs when the uh, the web, the files are encrypted or your computer gets locked, but really there is a lot of work that goes in beforehand, um, specifically by the bad actors. So the first stage is the campaign stage, and it usually um, is is carried out with either social engineering, smishing, vishing, uh, online shared service, uh, weaponized websites, as we just talked about. And um, they're gonna go out there and they're gonna kind of put something out into the wild and see who's going to click on it. The next phase is that an individual within an organization uh, downloads a malicious file or installs um, the actual, and by doing, or clicks on a link and by doing so, it actually installs what's called the payload. And the payload is the, the file that um, the malware is encased in. Once that is done, um, the, the malware is embedded or the person's embedded within the system. So just because a bad actor gets into a system doesn't mean that they have access to stuff. So now what they'll start to do is navigate throughout the network and try to find things. And it's, it's strictly a trial and error um, situation at this point. They're going to go and search for various different systems that are connected to those systems. Uh, if they're able to garner some sort of credential, they might go in and do some, something called credential escalation. So maybe uh, Bernard has a particular access to something that, you know, that person can now go in. Let's say Bernard is, is 
the administrator for the you know email accounts that they can go in create another user account within and call it something different and now have administrative rights now they'll be able to go in and access everybody else's email and be able to get more information so the skate staging and the scanning piece is really where they do their own forensics investigation on someone's uh on the the, the network that they're in when they're ready to execute, when they think that they've gotten the critical data, right? Because remember, not all files on a network are that important. Some things are benign. But when the bad actor feels that they have gotten access to critical files and critical systems, they will then um, garner those, those files. They will lock them with uh, an encrypted um, key, if you will. And usually there's in, in encryption, you have it's asymmetric, so you'll have the, the key that encrypts it and then a decryption key. Um, and then once that happens, that's when you as the uh, victim become aware that something's actually going on. And then they request, uh, you know, for you to pay uh, the ransom. And then the hacker awaits collection of the ransom. Um, so hold on, I see. Uh, how do you confirm if it's an authentic website when they are cloned? Well, basically, you need to know what website you're supposed to be looking at. So check for misspellings or letters that are replaced with numbers uh, in the URL. And um, also, you know, if it's supposed to be a .com, ensure it's a .com and not a .edu or a .co. So just confirming the, the site that you're uh, clicking on is, in fact, what it should be in the URL. Does that answer your question? Hey, Antoinette, I, I, I'll, I'll comment too that like usually this stage, right? This this sequence right here is usually pretty quick these days because websites can pop up and be taken down really quickly because they get notarized really, really fast. Right. Sometimes this can be a, a very long time. Sometimes they'll just embed something on the system and you won't even know and it'll be stealthful on many systems, and then they'll they'll do it too. Um, in answer to the the question that was posed with the how do you recognize? I I, I would relay that there was one piece. Uh, I mean, you see spam all day long, and if you look in your Google or or your AOL or your Yahoo spam folder, you'll see interesting examples of it. Don't ever click on them. But um, but the thing is, um, I we had one that was for Verizon Wireless. And they actually like made like Verizon dash dash wireless.com. And the person took the time to craft the email entirely. They even took the Verizon symbol off the Verizon website into the email. You click on the Verizon symbol, it goes to Verizon's website. The only link that mattered to them was the one that said, click here for invoice. And that took it to the, to the uh, rogue website. So it's really something you, sometimes you can't even tell. You just have to be aware that you're not expecting it and you shouldn't be clicking on things you don't expect. Yeah, and very good point. Um, and the other thing you can do, if it's in an email in particular, so everybody knows that you can embed a link to anything on an email, right? So you, you can have the text might say verizonwireless.com in the right URL, but if you hovered over it, it would have the Verizon dash dash wireless, right? So that would be the fake spoofed URL. Um, so you have to be really diligent. Um, as Bernard said, if you're not expecting something or somebody emails you something that's just out of character, I would always err on the side of caution and not click or download. Uh, but also if there's a box or something that they want you to click on, like an image, if you just not click, but just hover over it with your mouse, you'll see the URL will pop up. And if it's a string of weird characters, then you know for a fact that that's not correct. Great point, thank you so much. And you're right. Um, so in the past, usually it took a long time for um, the bad actors to kind of look for things. Uh, but now a lot of this, this kill chain here is automated. They have tools that will go in and look for um, particular information with keywords, right? So anything that's got financial keywords or intellectual property or HR documents or anything like that, um, they'll look for that right away and, and know that they've got it. Um, yes, an unsubscribe link can absolutely uh, divert you somewhere else other than an unsubscribe, for sure. All right, so um, just a little bit of an easier way for you to kind of see how this workflow happens. Um, first, you get infected, then the uh, bad actor will lock the computer, block network access, 
um, files become inaccessible. And remember, this can be anything from the internal networks to um, external networks to even websites, right? They can lock websites. Um, so just depending on how your uh, organization has your files and, and things managed, just know that it's not just uh, for your internal things. It could also be cloud services, depending on how your, your applications are linked. And then finally, the attackers uh, request payment to decrypt the system and threaten to destroy uh, decryption key or release um, your data. So oftentimes when these um, events happen, there will be a, uh, offer, an offer to decrypt one or two files. And the reason why they do that is they want to demonstrate that they have an accurate decryption key. Because in the past, uh, what was happening was the ransom would be paid and then the uh, criminal actor would provide a decryption key, but the decryption key either didn't work or the files were um, somehow tainted and then they corrupted rather and they weren't able to use them. So there was a real strong trend to not pay the ransom because they were like, well, there's a high propensity that you're going to get a broken decryption key anyway, so we'll just figure it out. Remember that the most of these criminal actors are doing this as a business. They often treat it like a business and they will have tech support in some cases if you're if you have any questions and they will they will answer tech support questions for decryption. They want you to be able to decrypt your files because then when you know someone else gets in, gets attacked with the same ransomware, they'll they'll know that oh well they had it and they 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 were able to get their files back so we should just pay the ransom and and get it over with right and just get this behind us so they want to make the money the other thing to know is that often these bad actors have done enough research about your organization to know whether or not you have um, cybersecurity insurance so very often these criminal actors will ask for a ransom that falls just below what the maximums are for your insurance. And that way it makes it easier for an organization to make the decision just to pay the ransom because the, it's not gonna come out of their pocket. They've kind of um, mitigated some of the risk by, by offloading it onto the insurance company. So, um, but, but you also need to be aware of the fact that if you don't follow the right procedures and have the right policies and controls in place, you may, even if you have insurance, you may not be covered for the event. So um, that's something we'll talk about with incident response in a little bit, but um, just be aware that these actors are very sophisticated, especially for public organizations that have to post things publicly online. Um, you know, when, when you're a school district or a library and you have things that are made publicly available, it, it makes it easier for you to be targeted as well. Who is vulnerable? Um, not well, basically everyone, it's actually everyone is vulnerable. Even the most sophisticated people um, that are very cyber savvy are going to be vulnerable to this. Um, there have been one or two instances over the last year that I've gotten um, smishing messages that appeared to come from people that I knew. That scared me because essentially their phones had been compromised someone went through their contacts list and sent text messages that appeared to be coming from those individuals. Um, but because in this one instance, because it was so out of character what the person was asking, and the, just even the way that the text was sent, it made me think twice. And so then I picked up the phone and called the person and said, hey, I got a text from you asking, is this you? And they said, no, I've, you're like the 30th person that's reached out to me. It's definitely not me. And obviously my phone was compromised. So this is beyond just your email um, because it, it, your phone's very vulnerable as well. And if you're using your personal devices to conduct um, our, your library business or RCLS business, be mindful that um, if you get compromised on your personal accounts, it could affect the library as well. And so even if you, know, even if you are a trustee and you're not an employee of the library, using your personal device, you, you have to take on some of the responsibility to ensure that the device is protected if you're going to be conducting email or anything else on that device. So here are some signs of a ransomware attack. Well, the easiest one is you're locked out of your machine. Um, you know, you try to log in and nothing's happening. You restart your computer, you can't get in. Um, if you're trying to access files, 
Um, you get weird file extensions. The, the newest one is .ryk. That's the Ryuk um, ransomware attack. You're going to see that there's some weird files here. And then you may have a TXT file that says, you know, open me or instructions. And it's going to give you instructions on what your next steps are going to be. Um, or you're receiving, you know, intimidated, intimidating messages on your computer and you know, your file's been infected. Click here to resolve the issue or, you know, all files on your computer have been encrypted. You have 72 hours um, to pay the ransom or you won't regain your data. So just um, if you're seeing strange files like this in, uh, in your directories, don't click on any of them. Contact somebody immediately to let them know that they're there and, and then have somebody that has the capability to get, you know, somebody with forensics capability in there to see what that is and, and identify what the issues are. So let's say hypothetically that you've, you're now in the position where your computer is locked. What do you do? Um, the first question that you have to find out is, does your library have an incident response plan? So a lot of organizations have IRPs for things like active shooter or weather related things. Um, you know, they have an incident response plan if they have a disgruntled uh, patron, but not many organizations have an incident response plan in place for uh, cybersecurity incidents. So that's the first thing that you want to ask when you leave this training, um, when you go back to your library is, do we have a cybersecurity incident response plan? And if you do, then the next question is, why do you not know about it? Because as the video indicated, usually when um, a ransomware attack happens, it's not to the you know IT director. It's going to be to somebody that is in programming or you know somebody that is um, you know, just an employee. They're not necessarily an executive, and so it's not enough for the IT department um, or even you know the, the the directors to have a plan, but. Everybody within the organization that has any role that touches computers um, also should know about the plan. If this were to happen to any of you, and I'm asking this question, so just write it in the chat. If this were to happen right now, do, do you know who you're supposed to contact and how to contact them? Help desk, RCLS maybe. <laughs> call John. John's not on the call, so we'll get to pick on him. All right. So the the key here is that um, it is important to have to take some action, but the right actions are very very important. Unplugging your computer from from the the network could be acceptable if that's part of your incident response plan, but powering it down might not be. So knowing what needs to be done, because if you power it down, you might lose uh, important evidence for you know, when the forensics investigation has to happen. So the important thing here is having an incident response plan, having all employees know that it is available and then what they're supposed to do and, and what are um, the, the next steps, if you will. Uh, and then also, you know, if you have computers, which I'm sure most of libraries do, that are used within your library that are open to the public, um, what happens if one of those computers gets infected? What happens if somebody brings a thumb drive in and accidentally infects that computer? How will that affect the rest of the network? Mo most case, in most cases, they're separated off of the a library's network, but it's really important to know if, if one of your patrons comes up to you and says, I don't know what just happened, but I clicked on something and this is up on the screen, what do I do, right? So knowing what to do for your internal computers and also the ones that are available um, to the to the public. And then the last thing here uh, that is essential is have you tested the plan? So let's just say you have a plan and let's just say that there's something written, you know, next to every computer. If there's an emergency, call this person. Uh, what if your VoIP phone system is down because it's now part of the ransomware attack? You know, do you have the ability to call through your cell phone or something like that? Um, but then have you tested the plan? The only way to know if the plan's gonna work is if you test it, right? So doing tabletop exercises or something to that effect, 
um, running through scenarios. I just did one last week with a bunch of K through 12 uh, administrators, and we did um, a ransomware attack, but business email compromises and it's a different type of attack. So knowing what to do if um, you have a ransomware versus business email compromise, right? Somebody accidentally transferred money, um, what do we do? So having the resources, knowing who you're supposed to contact and then testing the plan, by testing it, you're gonna identify the gaps. What we found in the training that I did with the K through 12 people were that um, communication was the biggest question mark. How do we communicate? You know, Who do we tell? Who's gonna be responsible for making the call? Um, how do we communicate with the public if our internal systems are down? Uh, do we use the website? Do we use robocall? You know, all these things have to be have to be worked out before uh, the incident happens. You don't want to be thinking about these questions as the incident is occurring. Does anybody have any questions about uh, incident response? It, it, it goes hand in hand with disaster recovery. Um, I, I, I toyed with putting that into this deck. I felt like it was getting a little too deep in the weeds, but Incident response and disaster recovery or plans are really, really important uh, when wanting to respond to an event like this and actually uh, making it as short as possible, right? So knowing what your critical systems are, how long they can be down for, how to get them back up and running, um, and then, you know, what do we do in an incident? Those two policies are really important. Does anybody have any questions about that? Quiet group today. Bernard, do you have anything you want to throw in there that I may have missed? Uh, no, it's and and the, I mean, I was thinking that a lot of the stuff is is really high tech, you know, more more technological. So it's just really important to to understand who's doing your IT and whether you contact your your director at a library or whether you contact your internal IT or you contact RCLS. Just understanding what the first step is like like you said is, is important yeah and then they'll take it they'll take it from there usually absolutely and that's the thing you know don't ever think that that the responsibility is going to fall on you but knowing what the steps are and who to call is really important um oh the other thing i wanted to talk about real quick with incident response um from an insurance perspective is like who do you call when the incident happens? And when you test these things, don't just have your internal stakeholders. If you wanna do a tabletop exercise, have somebody from RCLS present, have somebody from your insurance company present, have legal representation present. There are a lot of um, responsibilities, depending on what kind of data was compromised, there are a lot of different responsibilities that you're gonna have in terms of reporting. And so, and also because you get state funding and all those kinds of things, like there's a lot of rules and regulations in terms of reporting. There are some insurance companies that essentially say, you know, we should be your first call. Um, one of the schools that I was speaking to last week said that their insurance company said, if you have an incident response, um, cyber incident, you call us, we will dispatch a team. They've got their go team. They have their forensics people on hand and their premiums are basically paying for them to come in and handle the incident from start to finish. That's best case scenario. If you can find a, an insurance carrier that, that gives you that level of service, it's worth its weight in gold. Um, others were like, well, you know, we have a checklist and they say that we have to do this, this, and this, but they don't have an act, they won't dispatch their, you know, cyber 911 team. So understand what your roles and responsibilities are, especially if it's a library director, you know, knowing what you're supposed to do is important, but also understanding what your obligations are from an insurance perspective is also important. I know some of the smaller libraries, such as Mamicating, we only have, you know, four and five employees. So a lot falls on our library director, uh, even facilities related things falls on her. So under having her understand what her resources are and um, what we need to do is really important. And if you don't check the boxes and do the things that you're supposed to be doing from an insurance perspective, even though you have cybersecurity and coverage, they won't cover the incident. So then you're kind of left on your own. Um, and even some of the libraries, so when we did the first training, I don't know if you attended it or not, but it was kind of the cybersecurity 101. I talked about four different library attacks that had happened in one of those libraries um, they were able to utilize insurance to mitigate the cost of getting back up online, but the insurance did not cover the forensics. So they actually never knew what happened and why. And that's a problem because technically their network could still be infected and they don't know it, right? So even though they had backups and they were able to get back online, 
there could be something planted. You know, if you remember that kill chain, there's a, a piece in there where they, they embed malware that could still have been in there if they didn't do the forensics to find out where and how. Uh, so it's really important to know, you know, if you get that that forensics piece to understand what happened and and make sure that your network is still clean. So key takeaways here, uh, ransomware is not going away. As a matter of fact, it is just going to continue to grow. The uh, attackers are going to continue to be more and more sophisticated. As Bernard said, um, they spend a lot of time on creating the phishing emails in social engineering aspect of it to make it appear like it is real. We are uh, doing a lot of hybrid working. So we're getting bombarded from every direction in a digital um, regard. So people are not as focused sometimes as they should be when they're looking at emails and trying to get work done. So just understand that these emails are being tailored to the work type of work that libraries do. Um, they're being tailored to the type of services that libraries take on. So uh, you need to make sure that you're double checking before you click on things and respond to things and enter credentials uh, anywhere. Uh, being prepared is essential to quick recovery. It's never a fun in you know, a fun day when you're hit by something like this. But if you're prepared, then you're going to be able to kind of move through the process a lot more quickly than if you're doing these things and learning these things for the first time. And, you know, I've been in physical security for a really long time and I always would tell when I would do uh, these kinds of topics, to conversations and talks for um, tabletop exercises for physical security. You never want to exchange business cards at the time of an event. So like the police department and the fire department should not be meeting a superintendent or a principal for the first time if an incident occurred. And it's the same exact principles in a cyber event. We don't wanna be exchanging business cards with insurance and legal exactly when we were hit with this because everybody's already in a heightened emotional state. And so we just need to make sure that we've got these relationships established up front. It just makes it a lot easier when you have to make that phone call. Um, as the first slide that I posted with all that text on there, uh, most ransomware events are a result of human error. I say it, I think, in every one of these trainings, and I'll say it again, 99% of the time, the problem exists between the keyboard and the chair. And that is just the nature of the work that we do, the fact that we're online all the time, we're consuming ridiculous amounts of content. And so um, it, it's just very, very easy to become complacent when it comes to security. And even in that, it's sometimes, most of the time, actually, I should, uh, let me take that back. It's not even complacency. It's just the sophistication of the attacks. We're not, we're not expecting it. You know, um, I, I could say this, we're all adults. I don't know if you remember years ago, it's all started with the AOL Viagra emails, right? Like they would send these bizarre Viagra emails and everybody was like, Viagra, that's ridiculous. But it was so like, so off the wall that most people knew you weren't gonna click on something. But now, as Bernard said, it looks like your Verizon bill. So if you've got somebody that's responsible for opening the Verizon bill and checking it and it looks real, they may not be uh, as savvy to double check that what they're downloading is real. So just making sure that we socialize this to the people within your organization. Um, a lot of libraries have volunteers. And so don't forget about those volunteers, people that are coming in to do things um, out of the, you know, the kindness of their heart. They also need to be aware, especially if they're touching your computer assets, what the procedures are within your organization. So having an incident response plan is very, very important. Practicing and updating the incident response plan is important. Just having it is not good enough, uh, but it is a start, right? It's like, the you know, it's good to do something rather than nothing, but it's, it's better to do the right thing, right? So we wanna make sure we have an incident response plan, we're practicing the IRP, and we're uh, periodically updating it. If there are changes, in your insurance carrier, that happens annually. Often we change insurance carrier. If there's changes in the legal representation, if there's changes in your library director, we just got a new library director, that plan should be updated with her contact information. Uh, if your services with RCLS have changed, you need to make sure that you're updating your incident response plan to reflect what level of service that you have with RCLS. Uh, so, so it's just, unfortunately, another thing that's gotta be added onto your plate but it's really important to have these things done up front um, in order to make sure that in the event of an incident that you guys actually um, have something so that people can follow. And finally, 
print out a copy of your incident response response plan. It's not sustainable, I know, but if your computers are locked and you can't access your IRP, then you might as well not have one in the first place. So the incident response plan should not be more than a few pages and print front to back on recycled paper, but I think it's really important to make sure that you have um, that printed because uh, if your systems are locked up and you don't have access to it, then it's gonna be an issue. Any questions on that? All right, so we are finishing a little bit early. Here's my contact information. If anybody has any questions on what we talked about, I know it's a lot, sometimes can be overwhelming. I tried to not make it um, super, super technical, but I did want everybody to just have an idea of what the flow of an incident would be when it comes to ransomware, how it happens, and um, how we're supposed to respond to it if, um, if it does happen. So I will stay on if anybody has anything to talk about. Jen, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add. No, thank you so much, Antoinette. Um, I will say, so recently we received, or I received a strange email and I forwarded it to my IT department. Now I'm wondering if I really should not have forwarded it, but just call them and said, hey, I got something strange. Do you want to take a look at it? Um, so the forwarding is, is probably okay. Uh, I, I think I actually got that same email. One of the um, one of the librarians, I think, within the RCLS system, had been had their email address had been spoofed because I received an email. I forwarded it to John and said, "Hey, this doesn't look right. Some, uh, I didn't ask for this from this person." However, the email was crafted very, very well. Uh, it did look like it accidentally went to the wrong person. So. Um, I don't think it's a problem forwarding to your IT department as long as you don't click or open anything. Um, also, I'm not sure about your email system, but sometimes you have the ability to quarantine things and then send it you know, through quarantine. So sometimes that's also um, an option. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I have a Can I ask a Go question? Ahead. Yeah. Um, regarding unsubscribe, <laughs> I get a lot of emails. And I want to unsubscribe. If I don't unsubscribe, I, I keep getting emails from that company. So how do I know whether- What email, what email um, platform do you use? Do you use Outlook? Uh, no, I'm, I, uh, it could be Outlook or Yahoo or anything. Okay, so what I usually do, if I'm getting emails from someone that I don't know, so if it's an organization that you bought something for, from, for example, usually, unfortunately, in their e-commerce online um, documentation, when you, it says, before you could purchase, click this box to, for our terms and conditions, right? Usually in their terms and conditions, if it's like a legitimate business, they'll usually say that by clicking this box, you agree to receive correspondence from us. So that that's how they automatically opt you into their mailing list. So if it's an organization that you are familiar with and you're sure that it's them, then unsubscribe. If you're receiving email correspondence from an organization that you never bought anything from or um, you never engaged with, one of two things might have happened. Your email address, at least, could have you know, been compromised through a third party and been on the dark web. And so therefore, people buy a mailing list. It doesn't even actually have to be on the dark web anymore. It could just be a data broker. We talked about this actually in our last um, session. It could, could just be information that they've garnered and purchased from a data broker. What I usually do is mark it as junk and block it rather than unsubscribe. That'll just oh, okay. throw, that'll automatically dump it into your uh, spam folder and then periodically just empty your spam folder. Oh, that's good. Uh, right? Yes. The other thing is like, like you were saying before with Verizon, I, I've gotten emails from PayPal, what looks yes. like the PayPal or some other organizations. And it looks so legitimate, you know? So I'm thinking, gee, it must not be. So I click on where it's coming from. So I look at the email address. Dropping, perfect. Yeah, then, then I know oh, it's not from PayPal. It's, it's well, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's some, weird, yeah some weird thing. So I remember I said before that I almost got caught twice. One was a one was a SMS text message thing. The second one was an email and I was looking at it on my phone. And that's usually where people get caught up because it's small. And usually when you're re reading email on a phone, you're on the go. And it's, it was, it, I was this close to, this close to clicking. 
And I hit the drop down exactly where the email was. And that's when I realized it was not the individual that um, I thought it was. So, so yes, especially on your phone, just be super, super careful about responding or clicking on things to emails um, because you don't see the full context. Uh, so just be sure that you're really examining things if it just feels off. Um, Mary, so I can provide you with like a super basic IRP. Um, if you want to shoot me an email, but the incident response plan has to be, really be tailored to your organization. Um, did Mary leave? Oh no, Mary's still on there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it does have to be tailored to your organization. And if you guys need support in doing that, just reach out and um, you know I can work with you guys. I have worked with libraries within our CLS. I always give a super, super deep discount for any of the libraries within our CLS. Um, Obviously, I have to at least pick minimum like cover my cost of my time, but I do not charge the libraries what I would charge a normal uh, commercial uh, organization. So um, it's just basically to cover my my costs. So if you need help with incident response planning, disaster recovery planning, doing tabletops, tabletops are the most fun. They really are engaging and fun. I know it sounds boring but it gets everybody talking and thinking. So doing a tabletop once a year or twice a year is a really good idea, um, depending on the size of your organization and how much turnover you have, because it just keeps people remembering. Like it just keeps people to, on point to say, oh yeah, I remember we just talked about this and this could happen and that could happen. So um, let me know. I'm always here as a resource for everyone. Great. Any other questions? I, I I just did want to comment too. It's just like anybody who's who's still here. Um, don't feel embarrassed if you receive something, yes. and even if you click on something, don't feel embarrassed because, like like Antoinette said, this is here to stay. There's business models wrapped around this, and their whole goal is to make you click on something, is make you open it, make you read it, make you click on it. It happens to everybody. It happens. To, we all know somebody that's happened to. So don't be embarrassed to act on it right away if it happens, because that's the only way to rectify what's what's what might happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. That's really, really important. And you need to also have that culture within your organization. So it needs to be from top down. People need to know that if they accidentally do that, that there's not going to be consequences to their job. It's going to happen. It, it just is. It's just the nature of the beast. It's, it's, it's the way it is. So please allow people to feel um, empowered to, to st step up and say, hey, this happened versus embarrassed or feel like there's going to be consequences. Um, there cannot be negative consequences to people that are reporting these things. Otherwise, they're not going to report and it's just going to be 10 times worse than it has to be. Great point. Are there any uh, dangers with an SMS message? As long as you don't click on the link, but if you were to reply to the message, because sometimes you don't know. Yeah, I would never, yeah, I wouldn't even reply um, because you don't know what's going on in the background and just the engagement might launch something. I'm not uber, uber technical, but I have read articles where it's, you know, an SMS text, text message was sent and by hitting the respond, it could activate something. Um, I would always err on the side of caution. If you get a text from something that doesn't look right, just delete it. And on iPhones now, um, every time you delete a text, it actually says report. So they're trying to gather information about these, um, the smishing in particular, the smishing messages. Uh, so if you do have an iPhone and you're deleting text messages and it's from something that just doesn't look right, absolutely report it because they're, that, that's what they're doing. They're using that information to kind of try to figure out the threat landscape. Hmm. Any other questions for this session? There is a follow-up session next week on Tuesday that will be focusing on part two. Yeah, so it'll be a little bit more engaging, um, you know, questions and answers. Uh, I like to gamify things. So this one will probably be a little more gamification, um, showing actual examples of, of phishing emails and smishing, that kind of stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording. Actually, quick question. Would it be helpful if I did more of a, I could change it. If we did more of like a tabletop type thing, would, would people be interested?